get started. Uh, all right, uh, so thanks for joining us, everyone, and also thanks to the organizers for including us in this amazing program. Uh, my name is Kristen Brethel Harwitz, and I'm a social and behavioral scientist administrator in the Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research, or OBSSR, at the National Institutes of Health in the United States. And I am a social psychologist and cognitive neuroscientist by training. Uh, today, I'm glad to be here virtually, uh, co-moderating a pa panel on practical and responsive science in the age of COVID-19, along with my NIH colleague, Dr. Luke Stokel, a program director at the National Institute on Aging. I think we can all agree that the COVID-19 pandemic has made abundantly clear that science needs to be ready to respond quickly and practically to our most pressing issues, which can have a significant impact on both near and long-term morbidity and mortality. With COVID, this included both a need to tap into relevant expertise and also to rapidly support new research on time-sensitive solutions. Concurrently, the pandemic has also been a quickly evolving natural experiment, affording a rare opportunity to study myriad biomedical, epidemiological, public health, and social, behavioral, and economic phenomena. Bringing together members of the research stakeholder communities Today, we'll present an evaluation of past and present efforts to direct and support quote unquote fast science, including research strategies, resource and infrastructure development and funding models. We'll discuss issues of practicality and responsiveness in science more generally, especially in the social, behavioral and biological sciences, and we'll also respond to questions and comments from the meta science community. In addition to myself and Luke, speakers will include Professor Elliot Berkman of the Psychology Department at the University of Oregon, Dr. Bronwyn McInnes of the Infectious Disease and Microbiome Program at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard, and Dr. Adam Russell of the Applied Research Laboratory for Intelligence and Security at the University of Maryland. Each speaker will take a few minutes to share their perspective on this topic. We'll take a question or two from the audience, and we'll have additional time for questions toward the end of our session today. Please enter all of your questions into the Q&A section of Zoom. And I do believe you also have the option to upvote questions, the whole audience. So please go ahead and do that so we know what's most important to all of you and can prioritize accordingly. Um, so we'll now get started with Professor Berkman. Hi, Kristen. Thanks for that introduction. Hi, everybody. I'm Elliot Berkman, Professor of Psychology at the University of Oregon. And I co-direct the Center for Translational Neuroscience there. My background is in social psychology, social neuroscience, and in health behavior change. Um, though for a long time, I've been really interested in this meta science question of how do individuals and fields choose the questions that they ask? I find that in psychology, you might be particularly guilty of being heavily theory focused. I mean, I'd say we were, it were infamously theory focused. Um, there's, there's nothing wrong with that per se, um, but the theories that we deal with tend to be incredibly abstract. Um, and by abstract, what I mean from, from our perspective here is decontextualized, right? Psychological theory is often posed in terms that make it sound like it's expected to apply to all people at all times. Um, and of course, we kind of recognize that that's a conceit, that that can't possibly be true. But at the same time, we don't actually um, dive into the details often um, and really understand under what conditions for whom and when um, a theoretical framework might apply, um, which I think is, is ultimately what this um, kind of relevance and practicality discussion uh, reduces down to. Um, so I think when thinking about how COVID might change social sciences and behavioral sciences in particular, I thought a lot about um, a conversation that my father uh, told me about with, with a, my father's an economist, um, and he had a conversation with a, a really famous you know, Nobel Prize winning economist um, after the 2007-2008 financial crisis. And this prominent uh, economist was really quite rattled, shaken by the crisis, not just at the magnitude and the harm, but really um, on, kind of on behalf of the field of economics. Um, and this person told, told my father, he felt that uh, that econ had failed. Um, econ had had just failed in its mission because it didn't foresee the crisis, and then once it started happening, um, it had no solutions, um, which was a you know a pretty stunning admission for somebody of that stature. Um, and I feel like COVID really um, applies in the same way to the social and behavioral sciences, 
Um, I feel that psychology failed to predict um, the main barriers that we're seeing, um, both in terms of compliance with COVID protective behaviors. You know, in the early days before vaccines, the question of how do you get people to wear masks? How do you get people to wash hands and social distance? Um, the barriers that we, you know, it's interesting now to kind of do this forensic analysis and look back and say, what were people saying? And there are several papers out there that were just this broad survey of like, here's all the possible psychological phenomenon that could be at play. And, and that's true. I mean, those are all relevant. But as a field, we really had no answer to the question of like, what is going to be the main barrier, um, which I think turns out to be something like political polarization. Um, and in combination with misinformation. So some people said those things were, were relevant, but we really didn't flag those as like, these are the things. Um, and then of course, the second problem is even once we identified them, um, we, we have no real solutions, right? I mean, you ask, a, especially in the stark contrast to the, to the sort of biological sciences where, you know, this amazing achievement, you know, 11 months from We've, we've sequenced the genome, genome of this thing to here's a vaccine. You know, behavioral sciences have had so many years to sort of say, okay, how do you get people to comply with expert recommendations? And, and frankly, you know, I mean, there's some things around the edges, but we have nothing. I mean, we have nothing that's really at that scale. So it's been very frustrating and disappointing. Um, and I, I have a lot of thoughts on, you know, what we could do differently. Um, and, uh, you, you know, I think a lot of the critique, some people will say, well, you know, behavioral sciences are, are harder, they're more difficult, they're, they're a little younger. And that's all true. Um, but I also think that's being too kind to ourselves. I think we really need to introspect and say, why, you know, what happened here? Um, why did we fail to understand what were going to be the most important psychosocial predictors or barriers to, you know, sort of behavior change, essentially, on a, on a societal scale? And um, why were we unable to produce solutions? Um, or why have, have, do we continue to be unable to produce real actionable solutions? Um, so let's, uh, I'll just sort of leave it there. And I, I think we'll have some rich discussion around what happened and then you know, how we can proceed. All right, great. Thanks so much. Uh, we'll now shift over to Dr. McInnes. Hi there. Uh, thank you so much to the organizers for the opportunity to uh, to be with you here today. Uh, as Kristen said, my name is Bronna McGinnis. I'm based at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I am the director of pathogen genomic surveillance uh, and co-lead the, the Broad's Global Health Initiative. Um, I think it's fair to say that the use of genomic data uh, for, what, for which uh, the, the Broad is probably best known um, has really had a, uh, a coming of age during the, the COVID crisis. Um, but really um, the, the idea that genomic data could help revolutionize the way we think about infectious disease evolution, uh, pandemic preparedness and pandemic response uh, has been percolating for at least a decade since the advent of next generation sequencing technology. I think as we move through this pandemic um, and, and hopefully start to turn the corner um, on the acute phase, um, I think it's a great opportunity to take a step back and reflect on uh, how, the, uh, how the response of the genomic uh, science community and the use of genomic data for, for tracking evolution of COVID and identifying variants of concern and understanding their, their impact and, and how our response needs to adjust. In light of them um, is something that we just have tremendous learning opportunities from. And it's really not about the science or it's only partially about the science. I think that's why this conversation is so important. Um, I think over the last six months or so, um, the kind of global response of standing up a genomic surveillance um, system uh, de facto, it's, it's fragmented, it's not perfect, but I think it's more or less happening around the world at some scale now, um, has been an incredible success, but I think we are a long way from a sustainable uh, operation that will serve us for uh, threats in the future and how we make sure that the gains that have been made during the short time during COVID are entrenched 
uh, supported and sustained into um, the, the future is a key question that goes far beyond uh, the science that underlies it and really uh, brings in elements of, of social science as we've just heard, um, economics, uh, global health, uh, global policy, and, and, and real continued advancement of the, of the science itself. So I look forward to this discussion. I hope I can bring some perspective from, from my angle of, of bridging fairly kind of high tech science with ground game public health and using it in the COVID response and thinking about how we can make sure that we leverage these gains in the future. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we'll turn it over to Dr. Russell now. All right, thank you. Um, so again, I want to encourage the audience to drop any questions that you might have in the Q&A. We will keep an eye on that. Also, once questions are in there, the audience is welcome to upvote any questions they find particularly interesting. Um, so I am going to speak a bit about um, NIH and the COVID response, but I just want to take a break here um, since we have uh, three experts um, that I really want to hear their views on some uh, important questions. Um, so I think Luke and I have uh, some questions, but also first, I wanted to see if the speakers had any um, additional questions for each other. So this is a chance for me to ask like my, my heroes questions. Is that what you're? Yeah, if you'd like uh. to kick it off. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Huh. Um, what do we do next? That's a good question. I'm just reviewing the, the there is a question posed in the, in the Q&A. <clears throat> so I'm checking it out. Um, yeah, I could summarize. I was looking at them. They, were in the, they yeah. moved to the dismiss somehow, so I, I oh. reopened them. Um, so the gist of it is there are a couple of them. I think they're all linked. But, you know, essentially, um, you know, uh, my takeaway from this, this there's a lot in this um, comment, but uh, I think COVID has exposed both the strengths and weaknesses of our science system. And I think in the interest of this particular conference, MetaScience, and taking a look at how our science um, operates and functions, um, you know, what are, what have we done well? What have we haven't done so well? Like how is, how is the community viewed science as a result of how we've responded to the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, and how do we need to move forward um, in the world of science in a positive way with very simple recommendations that you, you know, and again, you know, I think Kristen and I have a bias towards the behavioral and social sciences for the reasons that Elliot, at the outstart, you highlighted as uh, you know glaring weaknesses that I think were frustrating for many of us. Um, but if you could comment, you know, on that, you know, one thing that you mentioned is, you know, I think, uh, you know, in the open science movement, the use of preprints. This person um, points to preprints in particular. It was a very effective communication strategy for exchanging information um, throughout the pandemic and getting research. Um, you know, uh, circulated um, in a rapid way that, you know, prior to this age, you know, wouldn't have happened. Um, so things like that, just practical recommendations, thoughts of the strengths and weaknesses from your various perspectives that the, the COVID-19 pandemic highlighted, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I can chime in. Um, just, I mean, I guess I have um, the, the weaknesses and strengths. I'll start with the weaknesses. I mean, I think the big challenge or to Adam's question, you know, what do we do? Um, we, we need culture change um, in, uh, at least I'll speak for psychology. Um, and I think this applies to all the behavioral sciences. Um, and, you know, that's, we need culture change to, to re revolve around, um, be more uh, problem focused. Again, as Adam mentioned, you know, this question of what problem are you trying to solve? That is not typically the way psychologists think about their research. They think about their research in terms of theory, right? Like what is the prediction I'm trying to test? What is the theoretical model that's under examination? Um, I don't want to be too, I don't want to go too far, but you almost say we kind of need to abandon that um, or at least re recast the way we think about theory to think about problems, right? What problem are we facing? You know, this question of, sure, there's a lot of theories about persuasion and really none of them actually solve the problem of how do you get people to believe experts, right? Like that is the problem. The problem is people are not listening to expert recommendations that are based on real data, you know, that kind of problem. And we don't, you know, there's theories that sort of speak to those things around the margins, but we don't, 
do that. And, and, you know, it comes back, I know this comes up a lot in meta science, it's the incentive structure. Um, and, and it's certain parts of the incentive structure, I'll, I'll implicate um, ourselves, our academics, it's, it's our peer reviewers, it's our peer review journals, it's our tenure and promotion committees. <clears throat> you can publish, you know, paper after paper testing these abstract theories and finding support for them, and get tenure and, and just be totally fine. And so until that changes, no, this isn't going to change. Um, on the strength side, I think there's some reason to hope. Um, one is the funders, um, as Adam's pointing out, all the ARPAs, um, NIH certainly, even NSF to some extent, kind of get it. Um, and certainly private foundations also get it, right? They don't care about your theory as much. You know, NIH, you know, no offense or anything, I think that's a strength. It's like, it's not, a, you have to have some sort of theory in the proposal, but it really is about what is the problem you're solving and how is the science gonna solve that problem? So I think the funding is actually there. It's, it's really on us. And then the other bright spot that I really see um, that to me is like the thing that actually kept me in this field, um, kept me from just leaving outright, um, is this next generation of scientists, the trainees, the current graduate students, even the current undergrads, I'd say maybe especially the current undergrads, they totally get it because they lived through this and they're like, this is real. Like science on the one hand saved us on the kind of vaccine side and science completely failed us on the human sort of, you know, how do you persuade people to listen to advice and to sort of get along and how do you prevent group polarization? We completely failed. And I think that that sense is really palpable for this young generation of scientists. And I see, I see them actually, they're going to be the ones that will change the field because they're going to be intrinsically motivated to answer problems um, and not test theory. Bronwyn, do you, you want to jump Bron in there? Bronwyn, you had well, I mean, I just would echo what Elliot said and, and, and just add, I guess I'm thinking of it from perhaps a, um, a closer or more focused lens um, about the bridge between academic science uh, and our public health response. Um, I think what we've learned uh, during the pandemic is that the there's a, a, a gulf between those two uh, and it's a bit of a wild garden where where information and data and decision-making live for public health response versus a lot of, um, and the real kind of like operational implementation of that, whereas a lot of, uh, of really creative thinking and, and I think valuable contributions are being advanced in, in the academic sphere, but it's staying an academic exercise and it's incentivized um, by publication. It's, it's you know, uh, just not quite uh, closing the gap where, where the product of the academic uh, ecosystem is really informing in real time uh, the way that public health uh, decisions are being taken. I think steps have been made to, to close that gap, but I think that's one recommendation that I would have coming out of this is to formalize ways to, uh, to break down the barrier between what's happening in, happening in academia and what's happening kind of in our our, uh, public health uh, ecosystem. Yeah, no, I, that, that's a, a great point. Um, especially, you know, when I sat at DARPA, you know, DARPA, DARPA exists in, in part to do really innovative R and D, but also ultimately to transition that to, to use. And whenever you know the, the social scientists would stand up, they'd say, you know, where's your transition? Uh, and that's really hard <laughs> to prove when it's you know it's it's knowledge or it's it's a different way of doing things, right? Methodologically. Uh, to me, transition is when more people at DARPA are pre-registering their studies. Like that's that's a win, right? Uh, but it, it's really hard to hard to demonstrate that sorts of thing. And, and so I think that's thinking of transition as steps in that supply chain rather than just the end. I think is really important to communicate because that also puts the responsibility, and the onus, on those people in that step to realize the thing you're doing right now may be used on you eventually, right? Or may may come to impact whether or not you know who we get out of this. As it were, um, I'm still torn. Though I mean, this is great. The, the sort of flagellation is necessary. Um, you know, uh, mea culpa sort of stuff is is great. We need to do this sort of retrospective. There's still this element of you know, 18, 20, 19, 20, 2020. Pick the year you want to go through a pandemic in, uh, and you, you got to go with 2020, right? <laughs> uh, at least at least uh, all indications at the, at the, at the moment. Um, but I do think there's some some value, and maybe I'll, I'll I'll do this afterwards. Is is take sort of what the supply chain folks are warning from their experience of 2020, 
and actually map it to ours. So if you think about uh, supply chain folks are now thinking hard about how do we do the modeling in advance to under, un, uncover hidden risks, right? Things that are non obvious. Um, and I'd say there have been people in science who've done that fairly well to date, um, but not enough of them, right? By doing things like modeling and simulation to understand uh, what happens when uh, our foundational research is, is premised on questionable research practices. And now suddenly we, we need to answer questions like, you know, public health interventions. Uh, where are, you know, what, what is the ultimate impact of those sorts of things? Where are the uncovered uh, the hidden risks? And I think, you know, both of your points is right that uh, in very few models I saw, and this is particularly uh, relevant to the United States, of course, other, other areas of the world are, are struggling just to get vaccines, but very few models I saw ever predicted that demand would be the bottleneck for vaccine uh, you know, distribution. Um, that, that should be a hidden risk, right? That we didn't anticipate, but also uh, indicate that perhaps the hidden risk of this supply chain was science communication, right? As you point out, Elliot, and that's, we're not thinking about that in terms of very you know, crunchy, gritty details, but I think modeling would have revealed that if we had, had a concerted effort to, to explore those. Um, and there's a number of other uh, interesting lessons. I think one, one of the other things I think that uh, is sort of a, 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 a tie in the win-loss column is uh, process adoptions or, or technological advances in terms of process adoptions. I mean, yes, preprints are awesome, um, but they also just, like with social media, have signaled that the ability to increase noise as well as signal is, is, is huge there as well. Um, so I think there, I think there are uh, still you know, significant technological process uh, innovations that we, we need to adopt earlier on uh, within that supply chain, as it were. Um, I, I'd say, though, to, to me, again, um, the, the last win that I saw, at least what we did well, was the fact that, uh, you know, sort of this flagellation is really important because it's, I, I think it creates and continues to perpetuate the scientific community's general ethos, which is we really do care. We really will answer the call when, when it comes. It's just a question of, as Elliot points out, have we been sharpening our axes well enough to be able to solve that problem? Um, I do actually hear a lot of concerns from people who are uh, proponents of sort of curiosity-driven research, which is important. I'm not, I'm not disputing that. Um, but even at that level, you should be thinking in mind of like what problem ultimately or what problems could this solve? And so from a, you know, this idea of the lesson of supply chain of diversify your stock base, um, you should, you know, if, if you're hitting something truly foundational and fundamental, you should be able to point to 15 problems that might be solved in this regard. But, it, but if it's if the end of the, there's, the supply chain, there's no problem, or at least that you can't, you can't, can't identify, it, it really does call into question like, Okay, <laughs> is, there, is, there better, better, uh, is there a better use of that kind of time? Uh, and I'm actually reminded of, and I'll stop here, I promise, um, part, part of the reason why I've gone on to Arliss, uh, where we're, we're really interested in things like cognitive security and disinformation, um, was there's a story of a, of a famous physicist visiting a national lab, asking the graduate students, sort of, what are you working on? And they're all revealing, talking about the projects. And then he says, well, what do you think are the most important problems in physics? And they say, oh, well, that's, that's quantum mechanics. He's like, so, so why aren't you working on that, right? If that's the most important problem, Get on that, and uh, and I uh, I'm excited to to continue to help what I think are, is probably one of the most important problems. But I think the same reminder should be should be shouted high and, and, and broad from from you know funding agencies. Let's get after the most important problems, even if they're the hardest, right, Elliot? I just want to acknowledge, though, that uh, both from the point that Elliot made earlier, and I and some of the kind of points you're riffing on there, Adam, that um, well. The, the science um, that has delivered or enabled uh, the development of, of the vaccines that are now in, in you know, people around the world um, did come quickly. And of course, that is uh, in huge part due to the, the funding and, the, and just the human uh, resource and intellectual power that was put behind it over the last 18 months. That is standing on the shoulders of decades of basic hypothesis-driven research in, in RNA and mRNA biology, you know, not even thinking so much about vaccines or, or, or products or kind of health solutions. Um, and so I think we, we can't celebrate the success of that, um, that, that end of the supply chain without looking back at the beginning of it and how we got there. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I, I want to rip on that a little bit. Great. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Elliot. Go ahead. Well, if you want to, I mean, my, I was, I'll just quickly say that let's talk about that because this, this, um, one of my, the solutions that I have sort of presented or part of the solution is to try to explode the distinction between basic and applied 
science. I mean, I think that's that's an artificial distinction, and, and I think it's actually just completely unhelpful um, and counterproductive because, well, especially in the social sciences, this sort of so-called basic has been elevated above applied, um, and that that's true in some other fields too. Um, and so, uh, but because I, I think there are ways if if by basic you mean sort of theory testing um, and applied, you mean you know, sort of contextualized, there's ways to do both. I mean, there's no real need to, to pick one or the other. Um, and I, I would conjecture, Brown, that, that a lot of that, you know, the sort of foundational work in mRNA and that, that kind of stuff was along the lines of what Adam's describing of like, well, this is a, it is a so-called basic thing. It doesn't have an immediate application, but it clearly solves problems that I, you know, that people foresee down the road. Questions like, well, how would one, you know, fabricate this stuff? How would you create these, these um, proteins? That's, you know, where I don't, we don't do that in behavioral sciences, really. I mean, I honestly see a lot of sort of theoretical thing where there just no, concept of like, well, there is this problem in the world that this research doesn't actually solve that problem, but it clearly makes a step towards that. It, at least you need to consider that. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll just stop there, Luke. I, I want to hear what you have to say. Now, I was just going to kind of riff off something that uh, Brownwood said um, and get very specific. You know, um, I'm, I'm really interested in how, uh, for lack of a better description, the biological and behavioral and social sciences um, as kind of silos, <laughs> you know, have handled this um, pandemic. And so one thing you said, for example, that we tout as a tremendous success early on was the, the you know, the message was definitely, this is a communication issue. The, the message was out there. This, we, we got, you know, got, in 11 months, we have a vaccine. Wow. You know, and then you know, everybody else is like, whoa, 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 based on the science, you know, we're talking 20 plus years of uh, research that has gone through this. And from a communication side, how the message is perceived by the, the public, you know, we know that for issues like vaccine hesitancy, for example, the quickness, the, the perceived pace was <laughs> actually a barrier for a lot You're of- You're speaking to my heart, Luke. Vaccine. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, so that's the kind of thing. So how did we uh, in, in our field, you know, do such a bad job with that when we, uh, yeah, anyway, so I, I mean, I, that's a, this is a kind of topic that I'm like, it's very concrete, it's very specific. I'm sure we all have very, very specific thoughts about this. I'd love um, to shout that from anyway, the rooftops from you, if yeah, anyone yeah. has a platform that reaches a lot of people. I, I, uh, I think it's a message that we have missed, that we have failed when I speak to folks who are vaccine hesitant, one-to-one -one communications or, or panel discussions, it's always the point I hit first. This we did not pull this out of thin air in 11 months, you know, um, and and just walk through, you know, some of the developments and how close we were. I think we knew that the next major kind of vaccine campaign that the world needed, whether it was globally or or more focally, would be, you know, an mRNA-based approach um, if it made sense for the virus. And and we were kind of ready for this. Um, and, and here we are. I think the fact that we haven't shared that more broadly is is a failure of uh, of the way that we think about communicating this. But I I think the so point how, is also so oh, go. Go well I was just gonna get to I was gonna build on on you know Brownwin's point. I think Kind of like what you're saying, Elliot, about the gap between, you know, what we'll call basic and applied science, you know, this disconnect between what we know on the science side and how we're communicating our science or how public health is communicating our science. You know, what what are what are what are things that are set up that are, you know, we've talked about the incentive structure, for example. What are the ways that we set up our science and our science systems right now um, that lead to those kind of gaps and that we can address, you know, from your perspective, seeing this play out. I mean, I mean, again, I, at any level that you think is actionable for whatever you think is most important, I'm interested to hear, you know, your perspective on what you would do differently, you know, uh, to, to not make that mistake. Well, I mean, so, so let's start with the uh, softest of the soft sciences, right, which I would actually argue is the hardest science is, you know, anthropology. I'll tell you what an ethnographer would do, right? Um, one of the problems is we, we got to meet people where they are. Uh, and that requires you to understand where they are. And that's really hard to do oftentimes at scale when you're busy, like, you know, trying to put out a pandemic, for example. 
um, and I, I gave a talk to the NSF in which I, I said the future is qualitative, right? We, we need to figure out ways that we can actually capture sort of lived experiences that, that you know, Bronwyn's talking about, where uh, people uh, are not just objectively reju- rejecting vaccines because they are wildly irrational creatures, you know, calling it, it. It actually makes a lot of sense within the social context that they would believe that sort of thing, right? People not rational, irrational, they're social. Um, but that requires just as, you know, Bronwyn's point about the mRNA vaccines require 10 years plus worth of, you know, foundational work to build on. The same thing applies to understanding humans and their context and meeting them where they are, is that has to begin earlier on because it cannot be done quickly enough. Our, our survey tools are not sufficient and granular enough to give us that kind of lived experience. In fact, I would argue almost worse, they can give us a perspective of objective objectivity because we can capture this at, you know, network levels, social uh, scale levels, and yet fail again to capture what, you know, the lived experience that ultimately decides whether or not they're going to believe you as opposed to their grandparents or, uh, or, or alternatively, how do you get that conversation going with grandparents and you and the, the scientific community, et cetera. So, so what's, what's to, to noodle on there, I think. I would just point out, um, Ron, before I uh, hand the microphone back, that when I first got to DARPA, I pointed to a, a 1964 article by Platt, uh, James Platt called Strong Inference, in which he's beating up on the biological community for exactly the same things that Elliot is beating up on the social behavioral sciences uh, today, which was, you know, this sort of bespoke approach to, I have my theory, I have my particular model, I can't, dis- but, you know, I'm never going to actually disprove it because I don't actually make meaningful predictions, et cetera. And he beats up on biology, uh, I think, to, to get to where biology is now, in part, not, not solely that, but, but so that we, the situations are not incomparable. Um, but back, back to Luke's question, um, I think it is an open question uh, and one that comes far too often, too, far too late in the supply chain is to think about how to meet people where they are and, and you know, who those people are and how they differ. Over. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It needs to be, and I mean, I would just restate what you said, Adam, is that we need to be problem or, you know, solution oriented rather than theory oriented, right? So it's, you know, this question of, you know, okay, a very practical, you know, how do we get people to take the vaccine? And maybe in, I, I think the whole so psychology, I think from the very beginning is just completely uh, off track, right? Because of our focus of like, well, my research is around this theoretical model. It's like, well, that might or might not be relevant to this problem. And it, it really doesn't, the problem doesn't care about your theory, right? The, maybe there's some other theory that somebody else is working on or that nobody's yet invented that actually is relevant to this theory or in reality, it's a blend of many different things, right? Like you're saying, Adam, we're social. So you have to include, you know, okay, so what's the sort of social milieu? What's the social influence and how does that factor in? And what is the, you know, science communication coming at people? And what is this person's particular values, right? And so we, we do have the sort of bits and pieces out there, but we're really just not approaching the science from a kind of cohesive way saying, okay, I'm going to pick up whatever theoretical ideas, you know, that we know about human psychology that are relevant to this problem. That's just not how we go about science. Um, It should be, in my opinion, how we go about it. And so we're going to need to be more interdisciplinary. We're going to need to let go of our pet ideas and really focus on, you know, look, my theory might be wrong or probably it just doesn't even apply. So I need to learn some other thing or collaborate with somebody that knows how to do that. Which is again, you know, something where I think the biological sciences are way ahead of us in terms of, you know, any medical technology. It's, you know, it's biologists and chemists and engineers. That's the sort of we need to embrace that model in psychology too to really actually solve real problems rather than just, you know, push ideas around. As a biologist, I'm flattered that you think, or as a scientist, hard scientist, I guess, flattered that you think that our uh, community is so far ahead. I'm sure uh, if we looked under the hood, there'd be uh, be more comparable than you may think. But um, I just wanted to to add that I think we we need to to redefine the meaning of interdisciplinary, even in just the example that Elliot just gave. Um, interdisciplinary was working across really hard science lines, you know, biology, chemistry, physics. Uh, data science um, and and sitting on this side of of the hard soft divide, I feel like we need to be more closely integrated with with social science, um, behavioral science, economics, the things that it just in in my work, the things that are going to um, 
decide whether uh, genomic surveillance and the use of genomic data in public health response in, you know, in, in practical terms in the future um, will not be defined by what we do on the science, no matter how integrative we are on the hard science side. It's really about um, all of the forces um, beyond that. Uh, and I think it's time to open that up. I think COVID has really shown us that um, we need closer integration between these domains of, of research and, and application. So um, yeah, let, let me, I, let me I, challenge Ellie. Oh, sorry, Luke, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead, Adam. And then I'll well, talk about, I want to talk about something Brown would say. Yeah, so, so I'll throw the challenge back to Elliot um, and, and say, we, we, um, so one of, the, one of the biggest challenges in this, this area is, uh, in particular, if you're looking at the government to, to fund this, this kind of what I almost call anti-disciplinary research, um, is scoping a, a research topic and, and problem in such a way that it's actually tractable enough that you know you're making progress. It's clearly, it's obvious why it's hard, right? It's obvious why it's important. Um, and that you, mo most of your time at DARPA in developing programs is literally trying to figure out that answer of what is the actual problem you're trying to solve and how, how you know you're getting there, what difference is it going to make? Um, that is perhaps more, more of an onus on, on the funding side and maybe, isn't, maybe they don't spend as much time as they need to thinking about that because a well-crafted uh, problem can motivate exactly the kind of research you're looking for. If the expectation is it's going to organically emerge among scientists um, that has happened on occasion. I would not put a high probability on it because we'll go where the, where the funding is, right? But I so so I think the onus is back on 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 the government in part to think hard about the right problems that will motivate that. And so the challenge is, Elliot, uh, we got to get you to DARPA or or somewhere where you can craft those problems uh, in such a way that we make that that meaningful advance. Back to you, Luke. Yeah. So I was just gonna thanks for that, Adam. Um, and uh, I just wanted to talk more a little bit more with you, Bronwyn, about. Uh, your comment about interdisciplinarity, is that the right word? Anyway, uh, you know what I mean. Um, so um, this is something, you know, we've thought a lot about it in IH, um, you know, in our various silos. Um, and specifically, I was interested to hear about, you know, I, your colleague, uh, Pardis Sabetti, whatever, gave a talk and, and I was kind of harping on the, like, um, uh, you guys did an excellent job, like, we need more social science and you know i hear the message all the time yeah we're on board um you know so what is the bro doing i mean what are you guys doing for example to integrate more with the behavioral and social sciences on a practical level so i was i trained in boston i you know i was at mgh and i would go over to mit to work on technology that i was think you know that i wanted to modulate people's brains so i was like Who are, who's doing that around here you know oh it's folks at mit and, and they made that very easy by setting up programs so that we could collaborate and then you know you could then see, oh, this is successful, and then we can set up funding opportunities, for example, uh, to further further develop uh, the needs the research community has identified. So what have you guys been doing at the Broad? I'd be interested to hear more about your interactions, your formal relationships, any programs you guys have set up with the behavioral and social science community to kind of work on some of the issues that you guys have identified as important. Yeah, I, that's a great question, and and uh, I'd love to come back to you with a, a better answer in the near future. I mean, we we have been pretty head down and doing <laughs> our day job um, for a lot of the pandemic that Broad, um, as you may know, set up a massive testing platform, um, and on the back of that, we are, are are using the the positive samples for genomic surveillance across New England um, and and the nation, and so I think. A lot of our focus has been on just making that happen uh, in short order, but yeah, thank you. Um, uh, but I think what it's exposing is um, the reality that we have, we are just making it happen right now, and it's not sustainable in, in, uh, in, in any way going forward without kind of taking a moment to integrate these other elements. We're getting challenged. Um, on uh, data release, not global data sharing, um, open you know, public data release it, it is one thing, but in terms of returning data back to stakeholders, um, uh, back to individuals, you know, the, the lines of, of um, you know, public engagement and, and, and patient information privacy and you know, all kinds of in patient incentives to participate um, just some of the kind of behavioral um, aspects of of of, uh, of this particular angle on the work 
Um, and I think, you know, we are just beginning to accumulate the list of things we need to address to do this sustainably and do it um, better going forward uh, and, and need to kind of tackle those. Um, and then and then also the ethics, I think the kind of bioethics is something that the board is looking at across the piece, um, taking a, a more active kind of uh, exploratory, almost academic approach to the way we think about the ethical elements of our work and, and are the impact on community. Um, and so I think that's another another piece that we're trying to advance. Yeah, and so I, I, you know, so I would be very interested. I understand and I appreciate the work you guys do. I, I know quite a bit about it and it's very valuable, obviously. And I know it's like, mm -hmm. this is the pace of all of this is incredible. And, um, but, you know, I guess it's, yeah, and I'd love to, to hear, you know, get the get back to you point. I, I hear you on that. And um, I hopefully this is just the start of a conversation. Exactly. Um, but like, what could have been on the ground for you guys so that you don't, you know, you can do the work you're doing at the ridiculous pace that it's in, you know, o, you know, addressing all the overwhelming things that you're, you're addressing, but in a way that, you know, it, you know, you're more plugged in uh, with the communities that would be addressing, you know, some of the community, the social and behavioral science issues that we've all uh you know seen emerging because i frankly you know as far as i know we were not set up at all in any practical way to do that our science we're talking a lot about our sciences you know being more practical mm -hmm. and our science systems are is are the ways that we're we're communicating you know what is, is it i hear a lot about communication is that where mm -hmm. we should be focusing our energy you know you know so I, i'm not i don't bring that up I, you know needing an answer but really like mm -hmm. that's the, you know that's the kind of thing like is you know, if we were to go through this again, um, mm -hmm. you know, our, our incentive structures are the way that we're performing science, um, training people to address things, you know, open science certainly has tried to make democratize science to have more people um, participate, um, to drive this from multiple different areas, uh, to meet multiple needs, to grow the community. Um, yeah, the, you know, this, again, this is not, a, you know, I'm not expecting an answer, but you know, that, That'd be the kind of thing that we'd be interested to hear. Like, what would you would have been useful, really, frankly, to, mm -hmm. to have on the ground? You know, for I think just quickly. I mean, this is kind of getting into the weeds of the particular context of of genomic data and and genomic surveillance um, for for pathogens uh, for infectious diseases like. SARS-CoV-2, but um, in addition to some obvious things like technical capacity and obviously funding and kind of political will, um, I think we need to take a look at um, the regulatory landscape for this type of work and the need uh, for uh, the IRB kind of process requirements structure, um, especially when data, the data that we're generating is of, you know, public health value. It took some time for us to, I think, convince folks that it was, um, and, and now that it is, we're, we're still really kind of slowed down and, and complicated by the regulatory environment of doing this when really the risk is tiny um, of some of the things that we're trying to, you know, to protect um, with, re with respect to IRBs. I'm not saying that it should, I actually probably would say that some aspects of our work should not be IRB regulated, some should, and we should kind of define those um, so that we're not so uh, com encumbered by uh, by those processes going forward and have those um, elements in place so we can move quickly and not be going through <laughs> that process in, in a state of emergency. All right, thank you so much for all of your input so far. I think if we've hit a little bit of a lull in the questions. Um, I did wanna cover a few things that um, NIH in particular um, has been doing uh, during COVID um, and also you know, prior to COVID and since then, if that works for everybody at this point in our, our segment. Um, so Booth, Luke, and I are relatively new to NIH um, and our prior experiences as researchers and also uh, NIH grantees, perhaps as some of the audience here, is that the grant funding process was not particularly fast, um, both on the institutional and also the NIH side um, in our example. Um, but I'd say being an NIH or now and having firsthand experience of NIH's COVID response, I've seen that NIH, while it can be slow at times, it also can be fast and responsive to unanticipated health challenges, um, especially by taking advantage of the research advances and infrastructure it has developed um, and is continuing to, to work on. 
Um, so in addition to the miraculous speed that we've seen of vaccine development and tests, but you know, which of course were built on decades of research, um, both by NIH researchers and also the larger community, um, there was also a rapid effort to get research funds to investigators um, as quickly as possible. Um, so I just want to quickly highlight a few of those programs and initiatives that NIH put in place and also think about um, kind of what NIH is going to be trying to do moving forward. Um, so just a first example, so very soon after the pandemic began in April 2020, NIH created the Accelerated um, Accelerating COVID-19 Therapeutic Interventions in Vaccines or Active Public-Private Partnership um, to develop a coordinated research strategy for prioritizing and speeding development um, of most promising uh, treatments and vaccines. And efforts across the ACTIVE program um, to accelerate the identification of candidate treatments, uh, clinical testing of treatments and vaccines, including increasing clinical trial capacity and effectiveness, um, and also the evaluation of vaccine candidates to be uh, enable rapid authorization and approval. Um, and also importantly, ACTIVE has also prioritized identifying emerging COVID-19 variants and coordinating data sharing. Just another example program um, through the Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics or RADx programs, NIH has aimed to speed the creation of coronavirus tests, uh, ranging from rapid home tests to clinical laboratory tests. Um, some of these tests um, might be those that many of you have probably used at this point have come from this program. And through this program, scientists and inventors um, actually competed in a shark tank-like competition, which might not be the first thing you think of when you think of NIH, um, with the rapid selection process and pairing with industry partners um, to increase the odds of success on those. Um, and other aspects of RADx are focused on, um, I think something that we've been highlighting as important, um, com community-engaged projects um, to address disparities in underserved populations, and also exploring non-traditional detection and uh, testing technologies and scaling up those technologies. Um, and on that note, um, NIH you know, has tried to recognize that health disparities represent a major challenge um, of this pandemic. Um, I think something that a lot of people anticipated, but also probably not sufficiently um, and haven't been addressed um, kind of from the outset. Um, and one approach to address this has been um, NIH's Community Engagement Alliance or SEAL, um, which focuses on trying to provide uh, that trustworthy information to people hardest hit by the COVID pandemic through active community engagement and outreach. Um, and I just wanted to highlight a little bit kind of what extramural funding has looked like during COVID and also um, what it might look like moving forward. Um, so with this traditional, more traditional extramural funding, um, so at first in the pandemic, this largely came from something called administrative supplements um, or other transaction awards or OTAs, um, both of which can be processed more quickly than the usual full grants. Um, but those administrative supplements in particular, so those were add-ons um, to existing NIH grants. So it did limit a little bit um, who could get that funding. But soon on the heels of this, NIH also released new COVID-related funding announcements, um, and some even with accelerated processing closer to one to three months instead of the, the longer process that we usually see. Um, I think I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here. Um, so while NIH mobilized to become faster, um, many of the ways in which it did so are not particularly sustainable long term. I think that's kind of been a theme um, across how people have responded to the pandemic. We kind of move quickly to do our best, but we have to think about what we can do moving forward. Um, so however, NIH has done fast before, even in the larger context of its usual grant system, um, even dating back to the early 2000s and the 90s. Several institutes at NIH have utilized something called time-sensitive funding mechanisms. And these were funding opportunities with relatively rolling deadlines. You could actually apply any given month of the year. Um, and turnaround was closer to three to five months, even with the usual administrative and peer review process that was used. Um, and to date, these time-sensitive opportunities have been put forward by just a few institutes and centers at the NIH um, and just on specific topics. Um, but actually just last week, a concept for NIH-wide um, time-sensitive funding opportunities passed council review, meaning it's well on its way to being a possibility in the future. Uh, led by staff members in my office at OBSSR, this broad funding opportunity would allow for responsive funding to what we're calling time-sensitive events, defined as a change in program, policy, or infrastructure that unexpectedly arises in a particular population, um, or also the prospective evaluation of a new policy or program that would impact health-related outcomes. Um, so what we're talking about here are discrete events that might be a missed opportunity with the usual grant timeline. Um, and as with earlier iterations of these more responsive opportunities, um, this will allow for shorter times between application submission and research initiation, with the hope that it would better support this critical response of research um, with important practical implications for health. 
Um, so that's just a snapshot um, of you know, what NIH has done in the past, what it's tried to do in response to COVID and what it's thinking about moving forward. Um, and I think Luke's been dropping links in the chat if you'd like to look at those for more information. Um, but I welcome any questions that anybody might have um, and also any thoughts that our speakers might have on any of those um, ongoing or upcoming programs. I mean, that, yeah, that's awesome. You got yeah. So I just, I mean, yeah, yeah, we need more, right? More better, more faster, more, yeah, mainly more better, I would say in some cases, but yeah, it's really more faster. I'd say more uh, faster. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, it says the biologist who, who, yeah, has a, who has a, has a science she can believe in. No, I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, no, both is true. Um, I, I just think so. Um, so until we actually perfect forecasting, um, uh, you know, we're going to be faced with a future that's increasingly uncertain. And, and my understanding, Bron, correct me if I'm wrong, is biology's response to uncertainty is diversity. And this sort of explosion, as it were, not quite Cambrian era, but explosion of different um, experiments for funding. Um, and I think there's a lot more experiment and experimentation to be done, but I salute NIH for, for engaging with this, noting that some of these things will work and some of these things won't. And you know, Dar DARPA is famous for doing that too. Uh, we, we try to create an ecology in which lots of different efforts can be done and, you know, we'll kill some, uh, which is sort of how nature works, right? If it's not working, you, you're done. Um, that's why DARPA is a sometimes treat. You know, if you, if you want to live comfortably with a 15-year grant, we're not, we're not the agency, right? That's not the agency. Uh, it's not clear to me that, that that's, um, yeah, that there's a big role for that uh, at the moment, regardless. But but yeah, so I think these sort of experimental uh, approaches are, are really important. Um, the key is, of course, that the NIH needs to let us know how it's working, right? They need to they need to spread the good news, which also includes this didn't work, um, and uh, and I think that applies to other funding agencies as well, uh, both internally. I mean, to include when when I, when I was at um, DARPA, we funded a a seedling a small project with uh, Paul Smaldino doing essentially sort of modeling simulation of, they wrote that article about the natural selection of bad science. We were funding some modeling work on like, okay, so what's, what's the solution to this? Um, and there's strong evidence that modified funding lotteries, right? Having people get across a certain quality threshold and then just draw names out of a hat helps to prevent the Matthew effect. You stop funding the same people who already have the resources, which uh, not that you don't stop them, but now the, the, the up and comers have a chance, right? Because it's not based on sort of name recognition or necessarily even just you know past performance. Um, again, noting that the quality threshold, to my knowledge, that actually hasn't been done in the government. Um, that that is something that I think should be done as an experiment. Shouldn't be the model, but should be a model in this this you know landscape of of, of experimentation. So, yeah, awesome. Hasn't been done in our government. I, I know other countries do something like that. Um, fair point. Fair point. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, just riffing on a couple of things about those announcements. I mean, well, two points really. So one is the sense of urgency, um, which I love because you, you know, we've seen it from NIH a few times, but it's also trickled down into the research community, which again is something that, you know, and maybe this is my stereotype round one of, of the biological sciences or medical sciences that there, there is some sense of urgency. I mean, I think there's evidence for that in the peer review process, right? That peer reviews are a lot faster and, you know, on in general and sort of biology because sometimes what you're dealing with is important. Um, and I think one of the frustrations in psychology, like, you know, classic example are, are you know, flagship social psychology journal, JPSP, Journal of Personality and Social Psychology has, has these, you know, year long, two year long horror story, you know, four rounds of three month revisions. Um, that's totally common. And part of part of what irks me about that, I'm, I'm not alone, is that there's no urgency, right? There's no sense of like, well, this is important. We need to get this out there. Um, it, it's really just like, no, it's, it's theory. It's abstract. You know, it's sort of this platonic ideal. And, you know, that's, but this, this sort of event um, has really changed that. And I think that's good. I think psychologists are now having a sense of like, oh, wait, what I'm doing actually matters now. <laughs> like I need to get this out. So it's true with funding, but my point is it should be true of peer review too. And, and our peer review journals need to adapt. Um, and again, it's a, it's sort of comes back to this question of culture change. Like we need to wrap our heads around how do we, um, you know, of course you need to maintain the rigor and the quality but you also need to understand like, this is important. We need to get this information out there. Um, and we just, we really don't have a model for that. Is there then, just a, a technical question, sorry to jump in, but yeah. is, is there something equivalent to um, bioarchive or a preprint server 
yeah. in the social sciences there is okay yeah. That's really we, oh yeah yeah we have great preprint servers like our cyber archive and pre-registrations and all or you know pre yes um okay. but i think those mm -hmm. still don't quite have the stature of the peer-reviewed sort of imprint of um and, you know we're working on that but that'd be a good development and then the second point is adam's mentioning we never have, like the biggest cliche in psychology, it's probably true in other fields too, is you end a paper by saying more research is needed. Um, and we wrote a paper about this saying, we actually need a mechanism to understand when more research is not needed. We need to understand like, when do you just sort of say stop? Um, which again, I think is another problem with the theoretical approach. If you're testing a theory, we really have no, like very rarely, in psychology, our theories actually declared like, no, nope, this is just wrong. Let's let it go and stop doing research on it. Um, and again, that's a big detriment to the field because most theories are wrong. It's this weird duality, like we recognize that. Um, and yet they just li live forever. There's all these zombie theories, right? And, um, and, and part of it is, I think part of the solution is effect sizes. Um, and I think DARPA, I should give Adam in particular really good credit for this, which is like, in, in psych, this sort of significance threshold idea is it, it impedes progress because any small effect can be significant, you know, with enough sample and precision. Um, but, you know, sometimes we need to get to a point to, of maturity in the field to say, you know what, this effect, it might be there. It's, it's so tiny, it's meaningless. So let's just stop. Like, let's look at a different route here, right? And that's going to come from looking at effect size, it's going to come from a more problem focused rather than theory focused place, right? If the problem is, you know, how do we combat misinformation? Well, okay, so there's probably a hundred different sort of theoretical models that might make, oh yeah, you know, you'll get like a D, a, an effect size of 0.02 on this and it's significant. We need funders. And again, DARPA, I've seen, I've been a victim of this, right? DARPA needs to say, you know what, if your effect size is not, you know, 0.2 or bigger, just forget it, right? Like just there's other ways. Um, and it, it gets like the problem doesn't care about your theory, you know, pick the thing that actually solves the problem. And that's something that psychologists, we can do it and we can, and I've, I've started to see it. So there's reason for hope, but it's not sort of the predominant way of doing business. It, it, just very quickly, um, the, the, the other, I, I mentioned forecasting, perhaps people thought I was kidding, but I, I'm actually not. I think there's a lot of value still to be done in forecasting. And in particular, to per Elliot's point, to bring things like social behavioral sciences to forecasting, make predictions. Tell me what your theory will predict under these conditions. It will be wrong, right? But that's the start because that's the feedback we need to improve you know, the application of a theory, for example. So it's not that I'm anti-theory, I'm anti-theory that cannot be falsified or will not make predictions. And believe me, uh, even having had a large carrot at DARPA, there are amazing ways for people to try to get out of making predictions. Um, and, and I think that's, uh, yeah, so, so I'm just piggybacking on what Elliot's saying is, is the effect size is really important. There's other ways of improving this, but I think ultimately, yeah, I mean, biology really did start making significant progress when people were no kidding, willing to make different predictions based on different models and actually test those out to see which ones, you know, worked as it were. So, uh, yeah, so, so I'm with you in terms of like the prediction. The other challenge we have, though, and the nice thing about forecasting in a way is we don't, we don't keep track. Uh, we don't have an archive of who made predictions and how they were wrong um, or, or, or right. Uh, so when we're actually, I know, Kristen, you want to touch on things like infrastructure. Um, I think that's one of the challenges of the current publication processes is we don't know the predictions you made. Pache, you know, pre-registration, which I'm, I'm a big believer. We don't know the predictions you made that didn't work. Uh, so the feedback we're getting back is really incomplete uh, and problematic. So I'm back to the beginning of that supply chain again, that feedstock of the, the, the mess that's in there that now we have to use. And, you know, Elliot, tragically, as you know, we, you know, a number of people had to come out and, and talk about, you know, evidence readiness levels to try to convey this idea, like, stop, like you're just picking articles out of the literature and assuming that because they're peer reviewed, they apply to this really complex problem. No, God, <laughs> you know, um, and the fact that we had to blow the whistle on ourselves in a way um, is, is symptomatic of that, that problem is a way. But um, anyway. All right, so we have just a few minutes before we have to turn over to the next session. Um, any additional questions you guys have for each other um, or any additional comments you'd like to share with the audience today? 
So I'm going to share, uh, Adam, a good point. I like your idea of tracking predictions. So there's a, I know um, there's an institute at Berkeley that has this social science prediction. I don't know if you guys have seen this before um, that Ted Miguel runs um, at Berkeley. Um, uh, I think that's that idea of tracking our predictions is a really, really useful and interesting one. Um, uh, that the, the, in particular, the behavioral that could be useful, I see in, in various ways that we are, you know, we're not doing that so much in our behavioral and social sciences. Um, I just wanted to throw that out there as an example. Um, but uh, I wanted to hear more, you know, Elliot, you mentioned, for example, you've noticed a sense of urgency. I've seen, I mean, certainly everybody's well aware now <laughs> with the pandemic that, you know, there's a need for um, uh, us to leverage our science to address real practical challenges in a time, you know, a timely manner. You mentioned peer review and how, I mean, that horrible process for journal you know, review. Um, are there ways that you have seen or examples that you have seen um, in Bronwyn? I'd love to hear from you from, you know, your various venues of changes that are being made right now um, that we could, you know, because we also think about peer review on our side, obviously, at NIH. Uh, we're not you know, in the Center for Scientific Review, but we communicate with them. And um, are there ways that, uh, you know, we could, um, you know, take advantage of things you've seen that have been working well to move the, move the science forward more quickly um, to leverage how we're doing our peer review on our end? Yeah, I mean, I'll just chime in real quick and say, sorry to interrupt, Brown. No, no, no. I mean, I think I, 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 you know, bias, you know, I spent five years as an NIH reviewer and mm -hmm. NIH grantee and all that. So I like the NIH system and I like that it formally separates approach and significance. I mean, I'd say that's the biggest thing that we don't do in their peer review of manuscripts, right? Because psychologists do this thing to ourselves and we're not the only field, right? Where like, you, you know, it's not uncommon to get more pages of review than the manuscript is itself, right? <laughs> and so that's all just critique of the approach, right? From the NIH perspective, whereas the significance can't outweigh that. Whereas I, I often see in NIH review, to, and it's a strength of saying, you know what? There's some limitations to the approach. There's issues, Here's the, here, here they are, but the significance is so high that this is a high impact project. Right. And there's no way for peer reviewers or there's not, we basically just don't, it doesn't occur to us to do that in our papers. Um, very rarely it'll happen. I've seen it, but for the most part, they're just critiquing the method. Right. Or like, you, well, you haven't, you know, contextualized this within the literature, blah, blah, blah. Very rarely will a reviewer say, Hey, you know what, there's a few problems with this, but it's really important. We need to publish it right away. That like, you almost never see that. Whereas I do feel like you see that. And maybe it's more in the sort of biomedical engineering world. Um, but that's just un kind of rare in psychology and it needs to be less rare. I was just going to add from a, just a practical perspective and just a personal perspective. My sense is that the, the sense of urgency um, with the journals and, and their review process is there too. And that's it's certainly influencing me uh, about my approach to, to um, peer review of papers. Um, and I, I just feel I'm on a clock with the journal in a way that I never had before. They they have expectations of turnaround time. They're following up. They're chasing you down, and you know they're they're asking busy people to to do their job. You know to contribute to the peer review process for for the benefit of science, um, but with expectations now um, that are are much greater uh, in terms of process and timeline than than I've ever felt before. And I think that's really moving the needle. And I'm sure they're feeling it you know, because of science Twitter and preprint, um, you know, from the point of view of like the, the value of the product they're putting out, they need to be faster to uh, to keep up with that. And, and so I think that, that um, pressure expectation and incentive is just running through the system. And I, I hope we keep it because uh, I think we all, you know, know whether whichever side of the soft and hard science um, Kind of uh, axis you're on. It, it's too slow. Period. Uh, and uh, and and I hope that we can keep that sense of urgency, so the gains we make in the academic sphere can be translated. Yeah, and I was just going to say on on our side, just to be fully transparent. You know, Kristen mentioned um, our use of things like the administrative supplement and uh, OTA and other transactional authorities, um, but. Uh, as you may be aware, with the administrative supplement, you know, all of a sudden NIH program staff that have no, not traditionally been reviewers of scientific review, the first level of review, or the only level of review, were called on 
uh, because of the the nature and pace of the science to all of a sudden put on hats as peer reviewers in a way that, you know, for some of us that are newer, I think it's not such an abrupt shift, but for some folks that have been there for a while that hadn't done peer review for a while or haven't interacted with CSR, or, you know, the Center for Scientific Review, it's a, you know, it was a different, it's a different ball game and it's a different skill set, obviously. And um, so it's something worth thinking about too. So in part, I'm, you know, we were asked, I think, just by just like everybody, everybody was just trying to get everything done. Um, and it was a numbers game uh, more than anything. Um, and, uh, you know, there are ways that people have to get, I guess what I'm interested in is, if, uh, you know, not now, but if we ever, if you have feedback for how um, you're being vetted as a peer reviewer, you know, for things like this, how you're referring uh, colleagues to, to get them in the pipeline, um, to feed the system, um, you know, any thoughts you have about the model of how we were pulling in, you know, program staff to do a job that we really weren't, um, you know, we, we were doing as a, as our side hustle, you know, so to speak in this, in this case, um, we'd love that feedback from, from the scientific community, you guys and others, um, uh, cause we want to do a good job moving things as quickly as possible on our end so that you can get the research done as quickly on your end, um, as, as possible. I'm here. So, we hear that message. Yeah, quick. I was going to also ask Bronwyn, like, um, so they're asking you to do more of you faster. Um, what to your mind has been the, the, the best technical leap that has enabled you to be able to do that? Don't say the internet. Um, and actually, you don't even have to answer because we're running out of time. But but I I would welcome people. Uh, I, I see little uh, pots of efforts here and there to sort of reimagine peer review. Um, open peer review, ongoing peer review, something. Mm -hmm. but I haven't really seen aggressive experimentation along the lines of like some of the funding models with, with peer review. Um, and as you know, before I left, um, we started a program called SCORE at DARPA, which in part was meant to sort of maybe help with that process um, uh, by, by bringing sort of automated tools and ML, ML approaches to help reviewers, essentially. It was never meant to replace humans, but to you know, scale this up. Um, if, if people know of really interesting sort of, you know, experiments with peer review, I would love to know more about them because it seems to me that there has been a sort of a deafening silence at scale in that regard. And I don't want on a negative note. So I'll say something like, Robert, I like, uh, we've discovered that science is a human endeavor, which means it's imperfect, but also means we can fix it uh, or, you know, improve it. So... Uh, back to the slide, supply chains. Guys, thanks very much for the opportunity to, to chat here. It's a true honor. Yeah, thank you all. This has been great. That's a pretty good summary. I was going to hit a few points that I think we, we focused on as most important. So kind of breaking down this distinction between basic and applied sciences, um, meeting people where they are, um, realizing really the human element um, on all sides of science, um, coming in with a more solution orientation, problem-focused orientation. Um, and also thinking much more about how we can be more interdisciplinary across the board. Um, so thank you all so much for your participation and thanks again to the organizers. Yes, thank you all. Luke, I take the challenge. Thanks everyone. I'll come back to you with an answer next yeah. time. Yeah, <laughs> please, please. I want to hear it. All right, thanks, Rob.